Okay, so we're good to go. So our last panel is going to be uh, moderated by Jay Rorona, who is co-chair of our Youth Law and Citizenship Committee and a co-chair also of this task force that has put on this magnificent program. Uh, his side job is that he is a uh, deputy counsel for the school boards, is that right? something. something like that. So I will let uh, Jay introduce our our uh, panelists and uh, we're looking forward to it, Jay. Thank you, Dick. So I wa also wanna congratulate Dick as president uh, for putting this together. Let's hear it for Dick. Um, this is a conference um, that we're hoping you don't feel as though it's just another conference. We called this a convocation on civics um, because we wanted to convene the family of New York State. And by that, what I mean is we, we, we brought in teachers, we brought in parents, uh, we brought in students, uh, we brought in educators, school board members, uh, legislators, regulators, policymakers, uh, folks from the governor's office, because we figure that if this issue is important, it being preserving democracy, that we needed to bring everybody under this roof to figure out where we go from. So this last panel, uh, and thank you for sticking around, um, is designed to ask that question, which is, and, and to give you a little gestalt of what we heard today, and then I'm gonna talk to these folks uh, and get their, their thoughts. Um, we began, of course, um, at 30,000 feet by looking at where we were as a nation. What some of the organizations, the, the premier organizations around the country that are studying civics, how are we doing as a country? And then we had a second panel to look at how we're doing as a state. What's our temperature here? Are we giving ourselves a thumbs up, a thumbs down, something in between, right? And then we heard from some teacher, um, I think he was from Salamanca or something, I'm not exactly sure. And, and we talked about how we translate that actually into the classroom. And that was all extremely in, inspiring when we started this whole viewpoint about trying to make sure that all of us felt as excited about civics and preserving democracy as all of you do. That's why you're here. We thought, wouldn't it be really kind of cool to get a U.S. Supreme Court justice like Justice Sotomayor? Um, you know, I, I wanted to say uh, before I just start with some of the questions from our panel, and I'll introduce them, I think it was Ella from Bethlehem um, asked a question about how the law has changed um, since the justice uh, started on the Supreme Court. And I don't know if Ella is still here. Are you still here? You are. OK, um, I just want to tell you that that uh, many years ago, I had an opportunity to host uh, Sandra Day O'Connor at a law conference that we were running uh, at some point to some place in the country. I don't know where it was, but that same question was asked of her, but it was asked in a different way. They said, hey, um, you know, what was your favorite presentation that you ever gave? And she told this story. Uh, and it was a story about her past. When she got out of law school, she, you know, she graduated pretty high up there. She was a pretty smart lady. Um, and she applied for uh, uh, some premier uh, positions at major law firms. And in one of the law firms that she applied to, um, they, they took the interview and they told her that they wouldn't be able to offer her a legal uh, position, but she could be a secretary if she wanted to be. Um, and she said, um, continuing on, she said, and many, many years later, I'm on the U.S. Supreme Court and I'm asked to give a presentation to that same law firm who is celebrating their 100th anniversary or something of that nature. And they knew nothing about that specific checkered past of that firm. And she said, with this kind of um, uh, cherubic smile, she said, and that was my favorite presentation ever. Yeah. So the law has changed and, 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 and we need to certainly go um, even further. But what I wanted to mention here, I mean, you already heard from Justin. And, and so, you know, uh, he is, um, of course, a, a teacher in Salamanca. You haven't met yet Melinda Person. I think her uh, tag just says their person. Yes, she is a person. Melinda Person is the president of the New York State United Teachers. We didn't want this event uh, to occur without hearing from an individual who represents all of the teachers in, in the state of New York. So a pretty big position, uh, and it's such an honor and privilege to have you here. And we didn't hear yet from 
a superintendent of schools, right? Because we said we convened the whole family. So Oliver Robinson, a personal great friend of mine, who is the superintendent of Shenandoah, who's probably very proud because your students were here today asking some really great questions. Uh, and I wanna congratulate all of the students. Let's hear it for the students. That was, that was phenomenal, right? And then we have um, three students. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to just uh, introduce yourselves by name because I don't have uh, their cards in front of you and the audience has no, but each of you uh, previously had um, uh, uh, Mr. Hubbard as your teacher. Um, and uh, just introduce yourselves because we're gonna get your viewpoints here. And the students who are still remaining, by the way, before you introduce yourselves, um, uh, from, from the three districts, Bethlehem, Albany, and Shenandoah, I'm also going to ask you to come to a microphone, any one of you who has a specific point that you wanna make based upon a question that I ask for students. So I wanna involve the students because that's important, right? So go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, so my name is Mason Fuller. Uh, I am currently a sophomore in uh, SUNY at Fredonia, and that's what I'm doing here. <laughs> Thank you, Mason. Okay, next. Great. Okay. Um, I'm currently a freshman at University. Okay, great. All right, so here's where I want to start this conversation, and we'll also involve the audience, but I just want to tell you that um, we're scheduled to end, um, I don't know, about an hour later, so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we finish this program before you do, get it? Okay, that's, that's important for us. We want to make sure we're not talking to an empty room. Um, I want to just start by um, acknowledging, um, and I think I may start with um, Melinda, uh, because there was a comment made by David Bob, uh, who was president of the Bill of Rights Institute of Arlington, Virginia, that teachers don't have enough time uh, to provide civics education since we don't test on it. Right. So I wanted to ask you just from your perspective, representing the teachers of the state of New York, a whether you you know would, would agree with that viewpoint here in New York and whether that's something we all should collectively aim to do. And here's the nature of all of these questions, because what we're kind of trying to discuss here is not what's wrong, but a um, how we fix it. Right. Because that's really what we're trying to do. Go ahead. So I 100 percent agree with that sentiment. Uh, I actually spoke to. Several of our is that mic on? I don't know if that mic is on. The light, the light is on. No, it's it's on. Maybe you can borrow Oliver's and then you'll you'll, you'll switch off. Go ahead. Better. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I I agree with that sentiment, and I would have to say, since No Child Left Behind, we have been really leaning into emphasis on math and science education, and nothing against math and science, but it has really crowded out many of the other subject areas, arts, music as well. And, you know, when I when I speak to our members that teach in social studies, civics arena, you know, at first they were like, well, this is good. You know, we, we don't have the attention all on us, right? <laughs> we don't have all the pressure. So the, with that, it came with, there's came with some autonomy. Um, but what ended up happening is less and less time. And in schools, school buildings, time is, is measured by the minute, right? The state education department actually regulates how many minutes we have to spend um, on, on topics. And so as time has gone on, there have been less minutes devoted to civic education. And um, we have, as an organization, been pushing back on the over-testing and the high-stakes accountability that has come since No Child Left Behind. And specifically, one of the things we're advocating for is federal legislation that is called uh, the More Teaching, Less Testing Act. Um, and this bill would remove the requirement uh, for annual tests in English and math in grades three through eight and leave it to the states to determine how they would do assessments. We believe this would create some flexibility at the state and local level to design an instructional program that is more embraceive of the, the whole child and all the, the entirety of what students bring with them to school. And we love the, the great work that has come out of the Blue Ribbon Commission this past year and the portrait of a graduate. If you haven't looked at that yet, you should. Um, it articulates 
what we would like a New York State graduate to know and the skills that they would have. And what the Blue Ribbon Commission found was they held up the portrait of a graduate and our current regents faced accountability system and they said these don't match. And so I think we in New York are moving in the right direction, uh, but we have a lot more work to do, uh, including changing laws at the federal level. So you're thinking operation, not Band-Aid. Oh yeah, operation. Yeah. Okay, so an institutional change is what we're talking about. And, and the importance here, of course, is to get this education family together, right? Because if that's what it's gonna take, we need to get everybody on board to, to support that, as Melinda knows, certainly anybody who's involved here in Albany in any type of lobbying exercise, um, anything that gets advanced, um, if, our, if there are significant negative voices, uh, sometimes those things don't go any further, right? So it's important to make sure that we all understand that this needs to be solved. Um, and I think that's what the purpose of today is all about. Justin, I just have a question for you, and you alluded to this when you were speaking before, but despite the limitations and problems that exist, all of which Melinda spoke about, and she's 100% right, of course, um, you've made it work. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? Um, hmm. So for me, I would say that it starts with a district and administrator's support. Um, I think that when I... Uh, Two weeks ago, for example, I, I uh, talked to teachers in my in my region uh, who teach a push, which is AP uh, U.S. history, uh, because New York State now requires them to uh, incorporate some civics into their curriculum. And whenever I presented the ideas um, that they could incorporate, and hey, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this in my school, and um, so many times the answer was, oh, I would never be allowed to do that. Or, well, my school board wouldn't support that. Or I have, a, it's always a why of that one school board member that mm, she would she would really not want me to do that. And um, I would say that that is used so much as a, as a barrier. And I think right there, the difference when it comes to my district and why it's worked in my classroom and in other classrooms in my school is that we have the administrative support uh, we have the support of the community. When when we put up the pride flag, when my students put up the pride flag, for example, uh, that was not something that was universally celebrated in, in our community that, that had a lot of pushback. Um, and there were many calls that my school board members and that my superintendent got uh, people very upset about that. But they were able to... Um, help shield our students from a lot of that pushback, but also integrate them into the process, integrate me into that process to where if there was a community member um, who had an objection to that, um, sometimes they sent them right to me and you know uh, gave, gave me that call, but we're in on that call. So really I would say that one of the big reasons why it's been able to work in our school is because we've been given the support um, and really that foundation to help our teachers do their jobs. Let me just ask you a follow-up yeah. question about the pride flag. Yeah. What if um, the, the, the community's upset won out and despite the lobbying efforts of the students, um, ultimately they weren't successful. Do you feel that they would have become um, placed in a position to walk away from civic responsibility Oh, we lost, or would they have become more emboldened? Yeah. So for that, I I don't think I need to um, voice my opinion on that because uh, three students that I have here. I'm going to ask them. <laughs> Trust me, I'll ask them. Yeah. Um, so so I would say that um, the the part that I really focused in on was the process. There were many actions that my students have tried to take that um quote failed but when it comes to civics um which makes me think of what the the justice was talking to um when it came to how she writes dissents and who that's for there's a lesson to learn from that as well so um if if one of the actions doesn't necessarily work out so if pride flight didn't necessarily work out um they would have pivoted 
they would have found a different way um, or they would have just continued to regroup, continued to reframe and rephrase. Um, I think that that's what we would have seen. Uh, and that comes through giving them the foundations in civics to be able to do that. Right. It's yeah. the process, not the winning. That's right. OK, so and we're going to get to the students in just a moment. I just I want to uh, pull in Oliver Robinson to this conversation, because I was telling him before, if anybody knows Oliver, this is the longest period of time I've ever seen him not speak. It's just amazing. Um, but. But uh, Oliver and I have been friends for a long time. And Oliver, I, before I ask you, uh, well, I'll ask you a question, but here's the predicate to it. Years ago, you remember after the horrible shootings in Parkland, um, the students um, in that particular community who were the survivors urged all students across the country to have a protest, right, to really uh, speak about um, how gun violence uh, should not place them in, in a position to be victimized. Um, and many superintendents around the country were concerned not about whether students should be empowered to, to, to use their voice, but if they were to kind of just walk out of school, that would, number one, uh, be defying a whole bunch of different rules that were in place. And, and secondly, it might not be safe. And you and I had a conversation about how you want to utilize that um, uh, opportunity um, to have um, a discussion in your own district with the students, right, uh, to control it, not in terms of what they would believe, but control the environment so they could be safe and, and still do that. And, I, and I'm, I'm reminded about that today because you, you live that truth with respect to ensuring your students had an opportunity. So what I'm, I'm interested in here, and the question for you beyond that predicate is, throughout the day, um, we learned here that civics isn't a subject matter where we just check a box. It's got to be ingrained in all of the subject matters, right? Because in this country right now, whether it's worse than it ever was, I don't know. That's my my perspective, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, people talk at each other. They don't talk with each other, right? And, and, and we want to make sure that that is not the way our students um, leave us. Um, maybe they should be better equipped to do it than we as adults. So let's talk about what your thoughts are as a superintendent, how you can ingrain that in all of the educational offerings in your district. Um, thanks, Jay. And so to keep myself occupied all day today, I like took copious notes from every speaker. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciate it. Actually, the reason why I did it, because I wanted to point back a couple of things, and I'm going to point back something that um, Jason, right? Justin. Justin, Justin said, um, disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Um, and I thought it was a great quote, because I think in many ways, when you think about um, situations where students are placed in, um, they are disturbed by something that's happening. And yet they feel powerless because of how we have placed young people as a society often um, in a voiceless um, situation. And so for, from my lens as an administrator that everything should be a teachable moment, an opportunity for, for us to engage in, in dialogue to understand. And I'm gonna point to uh, a friend, I just met her today who are sitting beside, and she asked me a question again, something that Justin said, that sometimes it's not about do you agree or disagree with the particular topic? But what's the process to engage in conversation? What's the process to engage in, in, in trying to understand the, the, the viewpoint differentials? And, and so fundamentally, when we talk about civics education, and I think that's the reason why it's a struggle, because it's not a singular thing. It's not like you're going to go and learn a formula, or it's, it's not a singular thing. It's about how do we integrate within all aspects of our schools and the daily experiences of our kids um, so they have a sense of, of empowerment? Um, how do we ensure that our, our curriculum, our, our pedagogy, and it's ironically, ironic the student asked about the difference between a lawyer then and a lawyer now, and she used the word shepherdizing. How do we recognize that, that the fact that kids actually do access information differently? And, and trying not to put the old traditional method on how kids learn. And so how do we put more of the onus on us as adults to actually, when we say we wanna give kids voice and choice, are we really giving kids voice and choice? Are we just saying that as an appeasement? Or are we really trying to comfort the discomfort? Again, giving J Justin credit for that piece of it. So, so I, I think all these things come down to that and, and it's hard 
to put um, a, a state policy on it. And, and I'm going to punctuate this point real quick, Jay, because uh, I'm trying to get my eight hours of talking out right now. Um, <laughs> so, so, I, so, so today, um, and I'm not sure if um, Lester Young was, is still here, uh, Regent Young is still here, but he said something that I thought it was um, um, pretty interesting. He said, Educations, an education solution cannot solve political problems. But when I heard that, I heard the opposite. A political solution cannot become a, 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 an educational um, solution because it's gonna become a problem. And so right now we see civics education as saving democracy. Democracy in the mind's eye of most people is a political problem. And so, so, how, so how do we reconcile that differential, right? Where we're saying schools should do these things so we don't have these political problems. So it becomes a proverbial chicken or the egg, which one comes first? But in the day of, a, but, but the bottom line of it, I think we've been using the same word, discourse. It's about how do we create and the skills for discourse? How do we start that at the earliest levels within our systems? That the kids actually do feel as if they have a voice at the earliest levels in our system. That they could have disagreements at the earliest levels of our system. So that becomes a part of who they are to have those disagreements, work through those disagreements, and see those disagreements as learning opportunities. So I think you see the difference in schools and school environments that, that allow for that to happen, that, that those environments are also where kids do a lot of other things very well. Yeah, so just to follow up though, so your takeaway as a superintendent, because you're representing all of them here today, mm. right? <laughs> no, no, you know, it's no, no pressure, but what, what do you think your folks can do um, to get us to a better place. And that's a challenge for all of us. I'm going to ask Melinda the same question and 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 everybody else on the panel as well, because we know we're not perfect. But what you can know, administrators I, I, do? I think I think we need to stop being too bureaucratic in our viewpoints. Um, what's the regulation? What's the mandate? And then we try to follow the dotted lines. And, and we create this environment where kids are, quite frank with you, just test-taking soldiers versus creating an environment where, where we're saying that, you know, as leaders, uh, we have to be the one that create that. And at Shen, we talk about equity and opportunities and outcomes, and we don't apologize for it. Um, and so, so always say state mandates are the minimum. We just, yeah, that's a checklist. We, we're checking that off on the way to providing a quality learning experience for kids um, because we want kids to learn how to learn. We just don't want kids to, to, to swallow and regurgitate content. We want kids to learn how to learn. And so, so some of the things that, that we have been doing around uh, the whole civics and the capstone and some of those kind of things is a part of that, but it's only a small sampling of kids that are engaged in that. So, so how do we fundamentally look at the education experience as something that truly what it is? It should be an experience. It's a 13 year odyssey that kids are on. And some of our colleagues need to look at it from that perspective. And I know why people do it because we live in this day and age, not only, it's not, a, it's not an anti-SCD, anti-comment, but we live in a day and age in society of this accountability that when you, when you peel the onions back and we say, why are we accountable? for something that at the end of the day doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day is truly, what's the experience that young people have, the young people has to, to, to ultimately have a sense of significance as a person. And I think that's what we want. Right, for all kids, right? Because yes. I think that's that's what the some of the comments have been about the seal of civic re readiness, that it's wonderful, right? As a first step. Uh, because if the majority of kids um, are not really getting that opportunity because it's really being more perceived like an AP type of situation, we're, we're not really curing, you know, the problem that we have with people's ignorance about uh, the system. I want to bring the students into this conversation. Um, Brene Green, of uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Mikva Challenge, and I took notes too, Oliver, um, <laughs> she indicated that students know what's not working and have ideas of what needs to be done. So I'm gonna turn it to each of you. We're gonna start with Mason and what you went through the system. I know that um, Mr. Hubbard is the greatest guy on the planet, <laughs> right? Um, what about your experience? And you're, you know, you're gonna be, you're gonna soar to the stratosphere. We can see how successful all three of you are gonna be and, and the students in this room as well that I'm gonna hear from in a second. 
But what do you think could have been better, not in your school per se, but with the system to get us to this place where we wouldn't be worrying about preserving democracy? Yeah. So uh, Salamanca is a 100 percent outlier. We got lucky enough to have Hubbard as our teacher. Um, Mm -hmm. But a lot of teachers and I'm going into the teaching field. So I say this with no malice. A lot of teachers don't take students seriously. They don't let students do what they want uh, to an extent, obviously. Um, A lot of our school system is based around discipline and it is based around conformity, especially at the young age. So then when students get into middle and high school, they don't know how to express themselves and they're never given the opportunity. Uh, And knowing that Salamanca was an outlier, we were allowed to pick the projects that we wanted. I spent an entire school year devoting myself into a passion project um, that I got to present to my peers and I got to change my school. Not many people get to do that. And it's, that's one of the major things that needs to change. Students like Hubbard said, no um, social issues. We are aware of the political environment. We know what's going on around us. And not acknowledging that and not letting us have a voice in that is really where civics falls through. In order to prepare us for going forward, we need to have that experience in a place where it's safe to make mistakes. And we have, like, a lot of the way that Hubbard teaches is kind of hands-off, more of a mentor, um, where he will be like, oh, here's what you need to do. If you need help, let me know. Um, so you're, we're able to go into that and then check in with him and be like, okay, well, here's where I am. And that kind of experimentation and room to grow and room to move is what a lot of schools and a lot of civics programs are lacking, uh, and causes people to just kind of get stuck in what they know, which is that they're afraid of the system around them and they don't know what to do about it. So I assume you're going to you're going to use uh, Mr. Hubbard as an example of the type of teacher you want to become. Right? Yeah, I made the joke yesterday. He said that I should be a student teacher. And I said that I kind of got his whole shtick down already. So, well, I think the most compelling thing about your district that at least you were describing was that there may be viewpoints that some folks in the political world would view as liberal, Mm -hmm. but yet you live in a very conservative area. Mm -hmm. So you were able to show you can make this work, right? Because we can't just fight each other. We have to be in the moment, as Justice Sotomayor said, just hearing each other, listening. I mean, that's an essential skill as opposed to trying to win. Um, And and so many people become a part of any conversation where they're just thinking in subtext as how they're going to respond, as opposed to actually listening to the other person. Mm -hmm. Grace, give us your viewpoint. Yeah. So, okay. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So I think I have to agree. We we got really blessed um, being part of the Salamanca City Central School District. Um, All of our higher ups were extremely supportive throughout the whole process. But I do know that um, other school districts would be met with um, kickback and whatnot. Um, something that we focus on at St. Bonaventure University, one of our mottos is there's no learning without compassion. Um, and in one of my classes last semester, we had read this book. Um, it's called A Whole New Mind by Daniel H. Pink. Um, I encourage all of you to read it. If you've not read it, it will change your life. Um, and it basically goes through how we have the left brain, which is kind of like, um, your small detail oriented, um, kind of process uh like it goes through the processes um and your right brain is more um empathetic it sees things more holistically and both of these sides work together to um allow you to be a successful human being but i think a lot of us get stuck in this kind of left brained um non-empathetic holistic way um and in reading that book i was kind of like wow um and i was able to relate it back to the work that we have done civically um and it's just encouraging you to be more right brain more empathetic to see students to see other people to be able to um communicate effectively with each other mindfully listen um intentionally have conversations i mean that's being a um a right brained individual it's and it's so it's so important um and I think it's kind of funny that it's like it's right and left and we see both sides as uh, on the political spectrum as right and left. But 
at the end of the day, both sides need to work together just like they do in the brain. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it was kind of, it was an interesting analogy to see, but at the end of the day, it's just, it's being more empathetic, encouraging um, empathy and compassion. Like there is no education without compassion at the end of the day. Like we do say it. I think that, you know, it's interesting because I think most of what we learn today and discuss today is the golden rule, really, right? I mean, just treating each other the way we would want to be treated, not necessarily being patronized and agreed with if somebody doesn't agree with us, but using that that degree of kindness. And that was a word that sort of, uh, Justice Sotomayor used um, several times, uh, kindness. Um, uh, Kasanita, give us your viewpoint. Yeah, so um, I apologize for getting up earlier. I was going to grab, I don't know if anybody can see this, but I drew this earlier. Um, it says strength in our democracy. And in the back, it has our traditional Haudenosaunee flag. Um, I'm not sure who's aware of the history between um, the Haudenosaunee and the United States, but we actually had a huge influence in the political system that we know today within the United States. Um, and this isn't a criticism of anybody here today, but I think it's just showing that within our society, indigenous populations aren't brought into the question when we think about government, but we were here and we influenced the very government that we know today. So I think um, the existence of our government, though we are a sovereign nation and our influence on the political and even um, judicial uh, style that we, we know today, I mean, we're one of the, uh, I believe we're the oldest continuous um, democracy that is still like present today. Um, and I think, you know, Mr. Hubbard said earlier, like disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. And growing up on my reservation and seeing like all the children who are disturbed because they see no representation of themselves in the country that forced us to become citizens. Um, it's like, how are we supposed to find success within our own um, personalities when um, we've been shown time and time again that we're not as American as everybody else, even though we, were, we, we don't always want to be American, you know, but um, if we are going to be American, if we're going to be forced to have this identity, we need to have the ability to be proud of it. So I think... Um, civic engagement, the class for sure, like it helped me to, um, like my project was um, establishing more resources within the school district for Seneca language learning and Seneca and Haudenosaunee um, values and like just our ways of knowledge. And, um, you know, in the past, like, I've been told, you know, like, um, that I made my whole personality being indigenous and like fighting for these things. But in reality, there's so many questions that we try to answer within our society that could be answered by simply looking to the people who were here before us and the people who knew the land. And so I think if we turn back to those things and, um, you know, establish better relationships with the indigenous uh, nations surrounding us, um, it could have a huge impact on both allies and indigenous students. And just, um, I know I'm taking up a lot of time, but um, specifically for those indigenous students, me and my mom always say like, everything we do is for like my future children, the children that they're gonna have, like I want them to grow up in a better space than I did, not having to feel like they weren't like worth it in this world because they were indigenous. I want them to be proud to be in this world because they are indigenous. And in the um, great law of peace, which um, also had an influence on our style of government, um, we say that in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So, I mean, especially with civics, you can't make valid um, decisions if civics aren't being taught, if our history is not being taught the way that it was intended to be. 
and um, if like indigenous and African-American and LGBTQ history is being erased and left out of that history discussion and that civic discussion, then um, I don't think the next generation of students will be informed to make those decisions to um, better impact all of us. So um, yeah, that's kind of what civics showed me. I, I so appreciate those comments. I know everybody here does because the bottom line is um, when this convocation was being planned, it was inconceivable to us to not have student voices, right? What would this be all about? A bunch of adults just patting ourselves on the back. We need to hear these voices and particularly the voices of individuals who have been historically marginalized. So thank you for that for that incredible statement. Thank you for those comments. Oliver, I think you wanted to say something, right? No, I, I think I just wanted to, to, to compliment um, what she just said because it, in, in so many ways, that we as a society have a tendency to to fixate, um, if you will, on the worst case, you know, mm -hmm. and yet we are surrounded by many, many examples of, of people and communities that are doing great work. Um, but yet our, we always seem to bring our arguments to the lowest common denominator. And, and unfortunately, then we try to make policies around that. And those who are doing great work, quite frankly, you stop doing the work. Um, and so if we're gonna change the whole narrative, I think uh, once she graduates from Cornell and, and decide to, to do great work um, and, 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 uh, and she have a communications partner to help her communicate it <laughs> and then a teacher to, to help teach. I think I, I kind of point those examples out in somewhat of a humorous way because these are the, the great examples of, of when we wanna say things are broken, things aren't broken. We just don't accentuate the things that are working. Right. And, you know, it, it's interesting, too, because I just as a personal aside, as I hear these students, it, it gives me great optimism, uh, just like Justice Sotomayor was, was talking about, because I think most people in this room are probably tired of being depressed. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's better to be optimistic, particularly when we have the voices here. Now, we have other students uh, from our elementary secondary schools. We have Bethlehem and Albany, Shenandoah. I don't know if everybody's still here, but I want to hear and I'm not going to call on anybody. You don't be nervous. But anybody who wants to kind of tell us what's not working as well, that we really need to be um, not fixated on, but at least focus on uh, so that we can maybe change the equation. Does any of the students um, who did sign up to ask Justice Sotomayor a question, not necessarily this part of it, but uh, I'd like to hear from you if if um, someone would like to speak please come up and and cannot can we they, they borrow yeah borrow this microphone up here because we only have one cordless mic we have two of you so come on up and then we won't have that pregnant pause waiting thank you for for participating we appreciate it go ahead so I'm, to your name and, and where you're from and stuff i'm max i'm a current junior at albany high school i did want to talk about a lot of the civic successes at albany high you guys were speaking about yeah, put it right up to your mouth so they can hear you yeah, yeah. the ap gov program are the ones who get the seal civic readiness at Albany High, it's the reverse. The AP Gov students actually have to do extra work to get um, the seal of civic readiness, while all seniors are required to take a civics class, which they work on their civics capstone project year round. We also have a lot of other successes at Albany High. We have our student government program, which I'm the vice president of. And recently we went down to City Hall and we have spoken with our mayor, our city auditor, and other common council representatives. And we're actually gonna go back to them to have another meeting in about a week. There's a lot of successes that we do, we have done, and I really want to emphasize that there are things that we can be doing and that we should be doing, and not to talk about well, like, oh, well, what are we going to do next? Thank you so much. Yeah, so hi, I'm Rue. Uh, I'm a senior at Bethlehem Central, and I just want to say first off that I just wholeheartedly agree with all the points that you're just making just now. Um, I like if that, I was... Adults like to be complimented, so thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so if I could kind of just like make a point in general, uh, this is not just about like my school, but some administrative like policies, something like that can actually be very oppressive there if that's a way to explain it. I feel like sometimes like there are like certain like ways that they kind of like silence but not exactly like oppressively silence like the students um and like their voices it's like more like they kind of like turn away from them gradually 
And I think it's just like kind of that turns into like kind of feedback loop because like some of the students because of that are like slowly less and less encouraged to actually like raise a voice. So I think that just kind of like one thing, this is also not just with civics, but also like diversity with if any other like major topic in general that kind of has to be addressed. And when it comes to kind of civics in general, I think there's also kind of like a nuance between like forcing it versus like encouraging it as well. Because like, I feel like I love like the whole like, um program behind like the like civics like the seal like civic on literacy and everything else but i feel like at the same time there are times when it feels like you just have to do so much work and you're just like i have to do this i have to do that and i have to do that but just like i feel like the actual most merit that you can get when it comes to like civics especially when i talk with like students other teachers like just in general it's mostly about the discussions they have between like so many other like uh, members and like being able to kind of like keep an open mind there and being able to like fully discuss what exactly is like kind of like that best solution to come to and what exactly are there still other problems that could, we could still address like even in the future like after we've implemented this like I think that's also just something that's very important to kind of like emphasize on especially as we just kind of move on into the future to improve like civics and other programs in general. Yeah, so that's kind of just Thank my two you. cents. Thank you. Jump in. Please, of course. That's fantastic. Uh, two points you made. When it comes to uh, policies discouraging students, um, many times, not only in school, God knows in the political realm as well, that's the point mm -hmm. is to actually mm -hmm. discourage and to slow down. Um, I, I've been told many times when I, when I was younger, and my students are told a lot of times that. Um, we understand in that we we're on the same side as you but you don't understand the process and of what i found out this year from hearing from my students is that um they might not understand the process but the people making the decisions don't actually understand the need mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. the need for change the needs that our students have um and it's our job as educators to uh, make them aware of the process and teach them how to go through it um, yeah, but no, you're, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. you know, this, this brings uh, to a point that I want to ask Melinda about. Um, there are some representatives from, from an organization that I'm part of also called Democracy Ready, which is an organization really focusing on civics. Um, and my organization, the School Boards Association, was asked if we would write a policy to propose for districts um, to set teachers up for success in a better way because what was pointed out today was that so many teachers feel um, intimidated about bringing up controversial topics, right? Particularly if they're in a conservative community, are they going to lose their job, or, or or will their jobs, even if they're tenured, be made miserable? Um, will will the people with angry tor you know with angry people with torches come to the castle and protest, et cetera? And we, we we've seen some of this, so we came up with a policy that kind of sets the stage. Um, giving boards of education an opportunity to, um, you know, provide license for teachers to do this sort of thing. And I, I don't go to the, the specifics of it because it's irrelevant. For, but the question really is, from your perspective, how can we work towards the goal of empowering teachers to have those really robust conversations? I don't mean to take political positions, one, but, you know, and to 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 make sure students have their voices and discuss things that are relevant as opposed to things that are milk toast. So this is a really important point. And I, I noted this when Justin mentioned it during his, his I'm remarks. Taking notes on this. Justin. Yes. Uh, for those who don't know, there are 18 states across the nation over the past couple of years where they have passed legislation limiting what educators can teach. They've actually put in law that you can't talk about, they call it divisive concepts, right? Anything that makes might make students feel uncomfortable, which is heresy. Um, <laughs> and that's exactly what schools are supposed to do, right? You're supposed to grow and learn and uh, have these difficult conversations in a safe space facilitated by a skilled educator. Uh, and while we don't have this particular law or a law like it that has passed here in New York State, there was a, an alarming statistic that came out last year from the um, RAND did a poll of educators and two thirds of public school teachers in the United States say that they have self-censored what they teach 
because of fear. And a lot of that comes from not, not every teacher in the, the country has a union to have their back, which I want to acknowledge our nice attorneys in the back there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but our members are afraid, not only for their jobs, but also we have seen educators um, publicly shamed, called names, um, have death threats um, when they when they simply are teaching the truth or providing a curriculum that's culturally responsive or fighting to prevent books from being banned in their school library. So I would say it is critically important that school boards and communities and parents and everyone support our educators in being able to facilitate these conversations in our classrooms because our democracy depends on it. And I don't say that in a flippant way. Democracy is taught one generation at a time and every generation. And if we continue to, to scare our educators from having these conversations, from teaching these important lessons, we will pay for it down the road. Right, and we pledge to work with you on that, by yeah. the way. Um, and, and we've already gotten started in, in trying to get that message out because it's really, really important. Now, it's about 429, so in one minute, we'll be past the time uh, that we said that we're going to end this. So I just wanna um, ask anybody on this panel, um, since I didn't um, necessarily ask all the questions that you would have wanted me to in one minute or so, um, is there something else you want to say? I, Go ahead, I would Mason. love to say something. Um, so I just finished a study about cultural capital among teachers. Uh, and there is one called aspirational capital, and a lot of teachers have it. It is hope even when a system isn't meant to help you. And that's something that civics is here for. It is meant to give that to students, and it is meant to help teachers with that. And I think at the heart of everything we're talking about today was summed up by one of the quotes from one of my participants was that um, I am helping the child that I will never get to meet. And we need to keep that in mind when talking about all of this is that even if we don't see an impact now, working towards making civics better is helping, like Gassanit Day said, sorry, uh, it's helping generations down the road and it's very important to keep that in mind with all these decisions that we're making. Okay, I think there's one point that you wanted to make um, and, and there's, sure. uh, let me let me yeah, steal that microphone over here. Okay, then this will be our last comment and then I'm gonna close it out and, and turn it back over to Dick Lewis. Go ahead. Michael Gilbert, I'm a special ed attorney and very involved in attorneys with disabilities. And one of the things that often gets overlooked in this is students with disabilities. And I've mentioned this to people, that a lot of children with disabilities get excluded from civics education or told they're not gonna participate. People with disabilities being told that they are not allowed to vote, which is not true. There have been cases of people who are under guardianship who've been told they can't vote, which is not true and it's not legal. And it creates an issue that we have to, when we talk about the forgotten communities, the disability community is often the most forgotten. Someone said about schools conforming, well, students with disabilities often aren't able to conform to the norms of school and get outplaced. And that's why there's attorneys like me going in, fighting with attorneys that Jay represents. But we have to <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> but we have to remember that these more than any other group, students with disabilities, because they're the only ones that are told you're not going to be able to vote when you turn 18. Thank you for that. And, and you know, after this convocation's over, uh, the Bar Association uh, is charged with uh, under Dick's leadership, writing up some, um, you know, thoughts ab about how we can do better. And to your point, we don't want to improve civics education and we wanna improve it for everyone. So thank you for that point. I wanna just, one point of personal privilege and I'll turn it right over to uh, to Dick. Um, Gail Ehrlich, who is the only uh, member of the committee who didn't get a, a chance to get up here. I just wanted to recognize Gail. She did so much work on this. It, 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 it is, it's simply amazing how many hours this woman spent on this labor of love. The Bar Association staff already has been thanked, but I know Gail and I and Chris certainly want to thank uh, every, everybody on the Bar Association staff. You guys worked around the clock. This truly was a labor of love, and we really, really, really appreciate it. And I just also want to thank 
Richard, for, for this incredible um, vision uh, that, that you had. Um, I, I, I feel that we kind of hit the mark in, in terms of, of getting this a conversation going, and I hope that it continues. So thank you so much. Let me turn it back over to Dick. So thank you, Jay, and, and you took the words out of my mouth. First of all, a lot of people have been complimenting me uh, about this about this program. The truth of the matter is, is we have Gail sitting here, and we have Jay, and we have uh, Christopher in the back, and and they are the ones that so so much have done so much for this program, and I really think we owe them a debt of thanks, together with our staff which has done a magnificent job. And I really, uh, I really think that our panels have been fabulous and I look forward to seeing us do this again next year.